So hi, good evening to those who were able to join us this evening. Um, this is our last ACTL meeting of this lovely 2020-2021 school year um, on June the 2nd. Um, tonight, we're just gonna do a little bit of a wrap up and um, Bridget's gonna give some updates related to some of the topics. So, you know, any specific things related to DTL and the final budget that, you know, may be of consequence to um, ACTL, uh, you know, an update on summer school, kind of leaning into return to fall. Um, may, I didn't put it on there, but maybe some of the reorg, you know, um, information, um, which probably has stuff to do with the fall anyway. Um, uh, but first, uh, you know, again, so to make sure that people who are here, maybe people who watch this, you know, really just want to say thank you to everyone who has participated this year. We've had a great turnout, I think, all year, um, even with Zoom. Um, and, you know, we've uh, adjusted and we've uh, adapted, um, you know, kind of as things have gone. And your input to, um, you know, to the process, I think, has been very valuable and um, very much appreciated. You know, I know everybody has had a um, different year than what any of us probably could have ever imagined. And so, you know, continuing to support APS, you know, in this critical way um, is super important. And again, even more so, you know, kind of during this, this type of, um, you know, bizarre and ever-changing um, and unsettling kind of time. Um, so I just uh, want to, you know, make sure I, um, I start with that. Um, the other quick, uh, you know, thing is I've been reminding folks that if you are continuing, I have gotten some emails from folks. So thank you. If you're going to continue as the ACTL rep for next year, let me know. Um, similarly, if you're not, if you can um, encourage uh, your PTAs or your community organizations to try to find someone. Again, I know at the end of the year, um, it can be probably a little daunting, even more so than normal years. People are, are you know, the fatigue and sort of exhausted and just kind of want to get through the end of the year. Um, but if the PTAs even have somebody or somebody volunteers over the summer, because it is very, very helpful um, if we do need to provide any communication over the summer um, get any input over the summer um, and or it's very helpful for the fall because then when we we get the schedule out we can let people know in advance and you know the first meeting instead of um, unfortunately what happens a lot of time in the fall is there's a lot of folks who miss the first meeting um, because you know we're still trying to figure out how to reach the new PTA presidents and things like that so I know I'm kind of a broken record on that but um, but that's why it really is extremely helpful um, to make sure that we make the full use of, of, our, of our time for next year. Um, and real quick, before we turn it over to Bridget, um, Reed, did you, um, I think I saw a note, did you want to um, say hello as our school board liaison real quick? Yes, thank you. Uh, I do wanna say hello and just echo what Rebecca said and thank everybody for their their interest this year, their ability to pivot, their participation, and of course, the very useful uh, executive summary reports that um, the school board found, you know, useful and uh, interesting. So um, it, we had a obviously a very unusual year, but nevertheless, I think because of your interest and participation. Um, there was a lot of good things that came out of it from this group. So on behalf of the school board, I want to thank everybody. So yeah, that's it. Thanks, Rebecca. Yeah, of course. No, and we appreciate, um, you know, your participation and, and all your feedback and, and of course, um, you know, the support of the school board. Um, so it, did any, if anybody had any, um, you know, housekeeping questions or any questions about um, finding representative um, for next year before we turn it over to Bridget. And there's going to be plenty of time, you know, again, it's a very small meeting tonight, so um, we can ask questions. And then at the end, if there is time, um, uh, we can, it's, it's not 100% finalized yet, but um, we can kind of talk about kind of leaning into next year 
and, and what um, some of the discussions been um, for kind of uh, uh, ACTL moving forward, right? You know, from this year, which was really different to kind of traditional, quote unquote, traditional ACI and stuff. So if there's interest, we can kind of come back to that after Bridget's um, update. So anything right now, or we'll move on to Bridget. And I'm not looking at the chat, so if there's- Yeah, there are no questions in the chat, uh, but a lot of people haven't signed in yet. So please go ahead and do that. Perfect. Okay, so Ms. Loft, I'm gonna, and you should be able to share um, yourself as Uh, so hi, everybody. Before um, I launch into some business, I have um, several folks to, to say thank you to. I absolutely want to thank our, um, our school reps and our committee chairs and um, uh, committee members. Um, as Reed said, uh, your uh, executive summaries and your support of our staff liaisons have been um, really uh, incredibly helpful as we've moved through this very strange year. Thank you also to our vice chairs and uh, most especially to Rebecca. Uh, who's been a, a very strong partner um, with Sarah Putnam and me. Um, and I really appreciate um, her, her leadership and her guidance uh, and her sharing her, her perspective. Um, I also wanna thank Reed, uh, who's been a, a strong uh, school board uh, liaison. So uh, it's been, um, I, I'm, I'm wrapping up now. This is my 18th month in this job. So um, I really appreciate all of you for, um, you know, bearing with the rookie uh, and helping, uh, helping all of us uh, move through this, this challenging year. So what I'm gonna share with you now is um, a little bit on the budget, um, uh, some information about summer school, and then some information about what to expect for the fall. Um, that's what's in this PowerPoint. Um, I'll give the copy of the PowerPoint to, to uh, Rebecca so that she can share it with everybody else. Uh, Rebecca, you mentioned reorg. Happy to talk a little bit about that. Uh, but if folks have maybe Q and A or or whatever, I'm, I'm you know I'm flexible. So so um, I'll start with the budget highlights. Um, uh, uh, DTL uh, received um, three. Um, new sort of uh, globally impacting uh, positions, although there's uh, another victory also in this list. Um, so uh, we are in the process of, uh, in the interview process of interviewing for our Director of English Learner Services. Uh, that's a real um, uh, important, uh, and I think it speaks to the, the board's vision as well uh, role because it's going to help us uh, really elevate our support for instruction, our social emotional support for students, um, uh, the programming that we offer for our English learners um, and moving um, um, sort of concurrently and beyond our uh, DOJ settlement agreement. Um, uh, we fully expect that this director will be able to interface um, closely with our directors of special education um, through, uh, with Sarah as the Director of Curriculum uh, and Instruction, and then certainly across the Office of Academics and the Office of School Support. So um, we're hoping that uh, potentially this person might be appointed as of uh, July 1. I think that's what we're shooting for, um, but certainly we don't wanna rush the process. We wanna get, get the right person in the job uh, moving forward. DTL also, yay, has, uh, has also been approved to, to hire a data coordinator. And we fully expect that that's gonna be a really helpful position as we move forward and working with advisory committees. Um, I think uh, a moment of silence process. moment, getting a data coordinator. That's like a moment of silence, right? Right, or right, right. Or... Because we've needed it for so long. Right, so I'm exactly. I'm just gonna highlight that one on behalf of ACTL. <laughs> And thank you, Rebecca. Yes. So, um, yeah, absolutely. We're looking forward to that. And we're um, engaging in uh, interviews uh, this week with the hope uh, that we might have that person also appointed by July 1. And then um, something that uh, I'm also really looking forward to is uh, a DTL accounts coordinator. You know, we've got a significant budget uh, and a lot of range um, as far as our Office of Special Education, our um, um, CTE um, office, 
and then our, our several um, offices of curriculum and instruction. Um, and we've been relying on internal staff who have jobs of their own uh, to, to really ensure that we've got uh, good stewardship of our resources and that we're being smart about what we're spending. And so this accounts coordinator is really gonna help elevate um, that work. Uh, we also uh, were successful in um, uh, receiving funding for um, our social emotional learning screeners and our math screeners, math particularly for first through fourth grade. Um, and uh, so that'll uh, certainly help us as we're targeting um, student needs. Um, a big celebration, I'm sure, coming from uh, GSAC, our gifted services teacher uh, specialist has been um, um, allocated. Uh, and then in the realm of special education, uh, we uh, very much uh, needed uh, ASL sign language interpreters and cued language um, transliterators. So that's been very helpful as well. Um, we've got some significant resources coming our way, uh, funding for resources in the world of uh, English language arts in particular is gonna be supporting our transition to structured literacy. And then uh, for world languages, for Spanish uh, language art resources and um, French um, textbook adoptions. Um, so we're uh, really uh, very grateful for that. And then in our LSRC and Welcome Center, um, we, we've been able to hire um, or, or continue um, a, a person we hired last year uh, to help us with um, translation and interpretation. And this is particularly helpful with the DOJ settlement agreement uh, in which we've had to um, uh, translate um, a significant number of uh, what are termed essential documents uh, that into uh, Arabic, Amharic, um, uh, Spanish and Mongolian um, moving forward. So this, this person has um, really saving money by hiring a translator as opposed to um, outsourcing that. So Rebecca, I'm not quite sure. Do you want me to pause after each one of these? Then? Yeah, that, that's probably good. So there's a, there's a okay. couple of questions in the chat, I think. Um, Natalie, yeah. You wanna yeah, there's one on budget. Um, can you speak to the anticipated impact of the specific, whoops, ah, Sorry, it just scrolled on me. Can you speak to the anticipated impact of the reduction of the L secondary specialist position by 0.5? Right, and I appreciate that uh, being brought up. So while we are hiring a director, um, we did um, experience a reduction of um, the L specialist by 0.5. It's sort of a, um, a, a bright spot and a, a challenge. Um, uh, the bright spot is that we were able to uh, use Title um, III funding to um, create a 0.5 um, position that will be um, servicing students in the distance learning program. I'm sorry, in the virtual learning program. That's our, our name for it. And that is, um, you know, obviously a brand new uh, program. And so, and definitely there'll be a need for L student support in the program. So uh, it was really beneficial that they qualified for Title III funds and we had a need uh, with the reduction of the 0.5. So that in effect um, makes the specialist who would have been reduced by a 0.5 of uh, 1.0, um, but uh, she will be dividing her attention between supporting um, our secondary um, L uh, students and, as a 0.5 and then a 0.5 um, as an L uh, specialist in a, a virtual learning program. Okay, there are a couple of other questions that Sarah answered. I think there's one more in here, which is whether all the positions on the slide are new positions or just the three identified as such. Uh, no, I think uh, that title is maybe um, inaccurate because certainly the gifted uh, services teacher specialist is new. Uh, the ASL sign language interpreters and the CLTs are new as well. The translator is not. Um, that person was uh, hired from allocated funds last year, but that was just one-time funds. So we've been able to, to hold on to that translator moving forward. That's been a, a position that's now been embedded in the budget. So I think my intention in saying new uh, positions is those folks are sort of global to the uh, department. Um, but certainly want to um, celebrate the, the gifted services teacher specialist is, is something I know has been long thought after by GSAC. So. Absolutely. Um, and there's some questions here about Lexia and uh, Sarah has said it will still be in place next school year. 
uh, but a comment came after that, which is that uh, that Lexi is not the best and that it doesn't challenge students. So I'm just putting that forward for you. I don't know if you want to comment on that, Bridget. Uh, you know, I would say this is um, our, our first year in engaging with Lexia. Uh, I think one of the benefits of Lexia is, is that it's adaptive um, and it allows us to uh, get some, some strong data on our students' um, reading proficiencies. So um, I think certainly, uh, you know, I'd invite uh, uh, some offline discussion about some concerns that related to Lexia. Um, so yeah, I think that would be my response. Okay. And there's a question on whether FLESS is dead, dead. And the response is that it's still no longer a program at the elementary schools. Um, and I think that's up to date, Rebecca, on the chat. Yep, perfect. And again, if you have other questions, you can put them in and we can come back to them later. Um, but Bridget, if you want to go to the next slide. Oh, yeah, actually, so the, there oh, is one ahead. more budget question that just came in. Okay, uh, reduction in copiers has teaching and learning impacts. Um, I do know they ultimately weren't cut, but want to ask about the possibility of this in the future. Um, whether there's research and best practices on ratio of digital materials versus paper and pencil uh, that the move to less paper is based on, and whether uh, there's research you guys can recommend that we should read to understand how more app-based learning results in better student outcomes. So I'm going to say as a caveat, this is um, a, a challenging uh, to respond definitively since we're coming out of a predominantly um, distance learning year in which we had to rely um, uh, most of uh, fully uh, through March on digital resources with, of course, uh, infusion um, of movement and uh, manipulatives, particularly at the younger um, ages. So I think certainly we'd want to um, engage in that study moving forward, um, but uh, it's, it's hard for me to say now, um, you know, what are the, the comparative benefits have coming off of a year in which, um, you know, our reliance was uh, fundamentally on digital learning. I don't know, Sarah, if you've got anything to add from previous uh, work that we might've done in previous years. No, I mean, I think we're also taking a hard look at the, the at the digital resources that we did have in place this year that um, have, there are some pieces that obviously have student data collect, um, related to them. So looking to see the impact um, that those may have had on student um, performance. And, and the ones that were underutilized, are they, are they things that we need to continue having in place or can we pull them back? Um, so we're taking a look at that, particularly you know, given what Bridget just said, this was a year where we had to access a lot of things digitally and maybe some of the things that we had that just weren't utilized, we can, we can take away. Um, and knowing that paper will always be there, um, even in the absence of a copier, there are still paper-based resources that we might purchase like workbooks, um, things that you know, come with a textbook adoption. So there are still paper and pencil opportunities that will exist. Um, and I can answer the gifted services one as well. Um, we anticipate that will be up within the next week. Um, there were some pieces that we had to uh, do with, with staffing. And so um, once that we get the, the green light, that will be up and um, we're excited to find a good candidate. Excellent. Uh, the, one of the requests, Sarah, and maybe you guys can respond to this and have it go into the notes was whether you can recommend research that helps make the case for app-based learning resulting in better outcomes. Whether you can share some of those resources with us. I think we can um, certainly do that as a follow-up. Super. Okay, and we've got one, uh, maybe one more. Um, which is variation among schools with respect to availability of uh, printed materials. And this person's saying that uh, they're okay with getting a direct message uh, to themselves, but I think this is something that would be of interest to others as well, given the concern across ACTL about consistency across schools. Right, and I think that's a good example of the lack of consistency. I think one of the, the 
downsides or the highlights um, uh, that, that we learned this year is, you know, as we're um, trying to systematize, there's still room for growth. Um, we did not uh, give directives uh, to schools um, from a, a, a school system perspective uh, to provide um, uh, printed materials. Uh, so um, some schools uh, did more than others. Um, we did at the beginning um, uh, provide all um, K-8 and pre-K um, students with uh, distance learning toolkits. So different kinds of manipulatives ranging from um, PE and music materials to uh, CTE materials to um, literacy and numeracy materials as well. But uh, we did not um, sort of um, mandate, um, you know, a particular amount of uh, printed materials. And I think that's a lesson uh, learned moving forward. Okay, Rebecca, I think we can go on to the next slide, but I do it quickly or there will be more questions on this one. Um, sorry, this is Reed. Can I just jump in here for a second um, on the copiers? And I just want to point out, and I think it's important for everybody to know that this is a budget item also. And we started out the budget cycle with a $42.5 million budget deficit that is needs compared to available revenue. Um, the American Rescue Plan took care of almost half of that, fortunately, but we still had to make you know, over $20 million in cuts. And that doesn't even include the compensation increases that we considered and then you know, ultimately funded. So you know, every line item has got its constituency, but at the end of the day, you know, something's got to be cut to, to achieve a balanced budget. So you know, while we try and understand the impact of you know, copiers versus fewer copiers and everything else, Again, at the end of the day, you got to balance the budget. I just want to remind people of that. Thanks. Thanks, Reed. Okay, next. I have a uh, logistical question because I'm far more proficient at presenting using Teams uh, than I am with Zoom. Can you see the pictures on? I see pictures on my screen of people, or can you just see my slides? Both. I see you in the slide. You just see my slides. Okay, cool. Because uh, I noticed the pictures were um, hiding the, um, um, some of the work. so I was wondering, I want that to happen for you. All right, so let me see if I can. Ah, here we go. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about elementary school, and then second, I'm happy to pause as it um, you know, uh, if folks have questions um, about this. So as we uh, move forward. Um, so elementary summer school will um, go from July 6th to July 30th. Um, we have been able to um, enroll um, about 1900 elementary students in um, both in-person and distance learning models. And I want to pause before we talk about the rest of this. You know, we knew um, moving into the planning for summer school that it was, uh, we had much higher need. We saw that in a variety of the of, um, uh, data that Dr. Duran presented in his uh, monitoring reports, ranging from uh, Dibble's results to math inventory and reading, reading inventory. Uh, you also saw yeah, each of the grade reports. And so uh, we did see a magnified need. And I made the strategic decision to uh, put forth a needs-based summer school model. Uh, and that was really casting a pretty wide net, far wider than what we've done in the past. And so for example, we have never uh, said all uh, students with disabilities uh, who have IEPs um, or all of our L students would be eligible for summer school, but uh, really felt that it would be a remiss if we did not uh, cast that wide net, knowing all along that our teachers are exhausted. Um, and that it might uh, be uh, proved to be a challenge to staff uh, such a, a robust model. So um, uh, it absolutely, um, you know, came to pass that we were not able to staff that. And I am absolutely not laying this at the feet of our teachers. I live with a high school band director. I see in my husband uh, the sheer exhaustion that is occurring every day. And so um, absolutely our teachers need a break. 
Um, and uh, they are not, um, in no way do I hold them at all accountable um, for the challenges that we're facing with staffing summer school. I think the benefit that has come out of this process is we've had to be creative in how we're going to be able to support the other approximately 2,000 students who are not, um, we're not able to enroll in the APS formal summer school model. So I'll talk a little bit about that moving forward, but just wanted to put it out there that um, if we had not uh, sort of shot for the moon um, uh, to, uh, to try to, to meet the needs of uh, the much larger number of students who would need uh, this kind of support, um, I think that, might, that would have been um, um, steering us in, a, in, a, in the wrong direction as well. So for our summer school um, uh, elementary students, you see the students who are eligible. Um, uh, 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 we're focusing on our pre-K students who are four years old, so our rising kindergartners um, who received an eligibility letter, our students with disabilities who have extended school year or recovery services on their IEPs, or who are enrolled in a countywide special education program and then our English learners levels one and our temporary English learners who are students who have not, whose English proficiency has not been um, uh, yet assessed, but that they're assumed to be English learners. So as I said, that's about 1900 kids. We've got about 2000 kids who meet the criteria for additional support, who were in that initial um, uh, casting the net wide. Uh, and we know that they um, would benefit from additional support, but that we're not able to um, provide through our, our formal program. So we have been able to um, connect with a, a really structured online program that focuses on numeracy and literacy, and it's taught by a certified teacher so that um, those students whose parents are interested in um, signing them up, um, uh, can um, participate in what is essentially a three-hour program um, that is uh, synchronous, uh, that provides um, real focus on numeracy and literacy. That, of course, is not required, um, and I certainly understand that just as our, our teachers are exhausted, I know that our parents are as well, and that our kids need a break. And so um, we are also um, uh, working now to ensure that we are gonna be able to hit the ground running in um, accelerating our students' learning uh, come the fall. Um, one way that we expect to be able to do that is to use the, um, the, the data that coming from these adaptive online programs like Dreambox and Lexia um, that um, allow us uh, to really be targeted in our interventions and to do that quickly. So I'm gonna go on to secondary summer school and then I'll pause so we can talk more about summer school. So for secondary summer school, that runs a, a week longer than our elementary summer school, so five weeks. Um, you'll see uh, uh, on the screen, the students who are eligible to participate in our formal summer school program. And that's, uh, we're really focusing on our seniors who need a core class to graduate and on our eighth graders who need a core class to be promoted. We're also focusing on literacy and numeracy. So you see our ninth uh, through 11th grade uh, graders with um, D or E in math or an E in English. Um, also looking at our students with IEPs who qualify for the extended school year recovery services or in the countywide uh, special education program. And we have been able to um, uh, staff our um, English learner classes such that we'll be able to um, service our students levels one through four who have not demonstrated predictive growth. So um, even in that list, there are some middle and high school students who need strengthening in math, reading and English, but aren't able to participate in um, our formal summer school program. Uh, and so we do have a self-directive adaptive online program that um, allows them to practice their skills and increase their, um, their skills and that data would be available to their um, teachers come the fall. Um, we are also offering on um, new work for credit for our high school students, either through Virtual Virginia, um, and we do have APS courses in economics and personal finance that will allow our students to um, uh, get some of those um, additional credit courses um, uh, through summer school. So I will pause now and... Um, a question. Only one question so far, which is, 
whether there's a waiting list in case any of the accepted students uh, for the in-person programming change their minds? Right, so I will say that we have uh, sort of two timelines, one for elementary and one for secondary. Elementary has, that timeline has really elapsed. We've got a good understanding of the, the parents who have committed uh, their students to uh, summer school. And I should say this year we made the assumption uh, that if you were um, fit the, the criteria listed, we expected that you would enroll in summer school. So student parents had to opt their students out um, of that. And so uh, we also are um, targeting smaller class sizes. And I do want to say, folks, that you know elementary summer school for, for four hours a day for 20 days is tantamount to 10 full instructional days. So when we talk about summer school, it is not the... Um, um, sort of seismic shift that uh, sometimes it sounds like it. So uh, we want to really be as impactful as possible. And so with those lower class sizes, that will allow our teachers to be able to reach um, all of the kids in their classes that they have needs. So I say all that to say that, no, we don't have wait lists because we, um, especially in elementary school, have not had um, um, uh, seen a need for that because our um, students, once, it, once their parents have opted them in, they've stayed in. For our secondary, they had until Friday, last Friday to um, opt out. Once again, anybody on this list was assumed to be enrolled uh, unless their parents opted them out. Um, and uh, at this stage in the game, uh, we're also pretty full, although we're still in, in the, the week following, we are, our registrars actually have until June um, 8th to finalize registration. So kind of sh shifting sands at this point. Okay, and there's a question of what happens if you lose teachers for summer school because they've gotten better offers. Well, and you know, that actually is a phenomenon. So we did offer a thousand dollar incentive uh, for teachers and, and assistants who are willing to work in person. If you recall, when we sort of started this summer school process, that was the end of March, early April, um, uh, it was still unclear um, how many folks would be willing to teach in person. Um, and uh, we anticipated and talked to our surrounding districts who also are reporting the same that um, uh, it, it, might have been even more challenging to, to get folks um, to, to sign up to teach without the bonuses. That said, some of our surrounding counties have been able to offer more um, monies. Um, and so we have lost um, some uh, teachers, uh, particularly for um, our highly specialized special education classes, et cetera. So um, we will be able to staff with uh, highly qualified folks, um, but yeah, we have lost some teachers. And we have a question of um, whether there's anything you need the ACTL reps to communicate to the school communities about summer school. Um, yeah, I think it, it's helpful um, first to have an understanding of uh, the students that we've, we will be able to serve in our formal, our APS summer school. Um, and to reiterate that we are working diligently to provide opportunities for kids who maybe were initially eligible in that sort of expanded list, but that um, we're not able to serve directly. Um, we are going to be sending a letter to our secondary families. I expect it will likely be tomorrow, if not Friday, um, sort of notifying them of this self-directive adaptive online program so that they understand kind of how, what direction we're going with that. Um, and we did give our elementary families um, of students who wouldn't be able to participate in our summer school program a heads up about what was coming. More information will be uh, shared with them as well. So the information on this slide is really, um, I think, helpful for the community to be aware of what we're offering. Yeah, and, this is, and if you did um, join late, um, uh, Bridget's going to share this deck um, with me. So I will be sharing it out with all of you. So. Um, so if, if you did join late and you're trying to take notes or take pictures of it, I am going to get this out to you um, as well. So you'll have that, you know, to share back with your communities. Okay. Uh, the next question is whether extended school year recovery services are delivered in virtual summer courses. And uh, Nick says at least one school has said no. 
I think that really depends on what that ESY recovery service is. Um, and it's really individualized to the, the child. Um, so, you know, yes, per, uh, um, uh, according to need and what the, um, the model the family chose. Um, I will say that um, yeah, we do feel that uh, the in-person delivery of ESY and recovery services is has more bang for the buck, but we also uh, recognize that we've uh, there are you know our our kids aren't vaccinated yet, um, and there are families who have concerns about sending their children into um, in-person learning, and so um, yeah, Nick's right that at some school there's not, but it's more dependent I think on um, the student need and the model that they've chosen. Okay, and we have a question about whether APS anticipates that this will be the only summer it can't meet summer school needs uh, or whether there are plans in the future to address what happened this summer? So I'll answer that second question first and then come to the first question. This is really my first time as the Assistant Superintendent for Teaching and Learning in uh, sort of experiencing how do we launch summer school. If you recall last year, we did offer uh, summer school programming but it was fully distance learning and we were still figuring things out, right? So, uh, and I think absolutely we need to do some reflection on uh, what went well and uh, what are the challenges. I've, I've already shared one of the big reflections was, you know, um, perhaps over promising and under delivering is not the, uh, the best way to go, no matter how well intended it was. Um, and so uh, I can promise that we uh, already have in the works uh, some reflection opportunities. I will say this as well. So I'm gonna come back to that, you know, summer school is equates to about 10 full instructional days. So we really wanna see how impactful is it in moving students along, particularly our students who may be a year or more behind grade level, right, in reading and in math. Is this the most viable way to do it? Um, are there more um, efficient and impactful ways to do it? Um, and um, you know, while yes, we did experience um, significantly more shortage of teachers, it is usually a bit of a challenge um, to staff summer school in the way that we may want to deliver it. So um, yeah, we're, we're definitely looking at other ways that we might uh, deliver it, uh, deliver summer school and taking a page from um, some of our um, surrounding counties who have uh, um, uh, sort of pared down their summer school offerings while also ramping up what they're offering during the school year. Okay, I think that's up to date on the chat. Okay, all right. So next is um, looking towards next school year. Okay, so um, uh, I hope everybody's aware, I'm sure you did, you participated in the survey that we'll be offering an in-person learning model and a virtual learning program. So I'll do a sort of a summary of the in-person learning and then uh, the virtual learning program and then happy once again to, to do any questions. Um, so in-person learning will be five days a week. We'll have all of our classes in person with our teachers present. Uh, so there will no longer be asynchronous Mondays. Um, we'll have normal breakfast and lunch within the cafeteria um, and within the, the school building itself. We'll be offering, I'm sorry, I was typing quickly, so that should say in-person specials and electives. So Rebecca, the slide deck you'll get, will have the um, um, appropriate spelling. Um, and we'll also have normal bus capacity. Uh, Dr. Duran will talk a bit um, tomorrow in his uh, monitoring report about what we're anticipating as far as uh, some of the safety uh, mitigation um, efforts. Um, uh, but this kind of gives you kind of a lens of what we're looking at for next, um, next year. And then uh, we're also offering a K-12 virtual learning program. Um, yeah, you can see that this um, was a pretty popular choice, more popular than you might think, I would say. This represents about 5% of our student population. Um, and we did ask in the survey uh, for folks to let us know what they were, why they were choosing um, the virtual learning program. Uh, health certainly was um, a major factor, although there are some students who uh, felt that they were successful and parents felt their kids were successful 
in uh, the distance learning and so want to continue this. Um, this will be uh, a, a bit different, however, in that it is a separate program um, that uh, will be running sort of on its own with its own um, administrator and its own staff. Um, and that's APS staff. And they'll be focusing on the delivery of uh, quality virtual learning um, to and including a lot of personalization um, for students who are participating in uh, the virtual learning program. Uh, the curriculum and the pacing will be aligned with our in-person instruction. And that's uh, in large part because we do expect that at, for the elementary level at each quarter, there um, may be families who wanna transition back into in-person instruction. Um, and then at the semester for our secondary middle and high school families that may wanna uh, transition. So we certainly wanna make sure that when those transitions happen, kids are on pace um, and following the same curriculum. We do also anticipate that our um, teachers uh, in the virtual learning program will be able to participate in collaborative learning teams with their, their colleagues who are in person uh, to help support this, um, this pacing and, and alignment with the curriculum. Five days a week uh, of synchronous virtual instruction. So um, again, no asynchronous Mondays. Uh, we'll be attending uh, synchronously every day of the week. Uh, we're really working to make a connection with the School of Records. So um, students will have their same counselors at the middle and high school level. Uh, these folks to uh, loop with their, uh, their uh, students. And, and so we wanted to make sure that uh, they had that connection. Um, our kids will be able to participate in the extracurricular activities at their school of record and in sports as well. Um, we will, uh, we uh, have gotten notice the breakfast and lunch are free for all students at grab and go locations. And we'll be notifying um, folks about what where those locations will be as we get closer to the um, end of the, um, the end of the summer. So that gives you a sense of the virtual learning program and I am happy to answer questions. We've got a question about how many class options secondary students will have. Right, so once uh, the survey closed, which was on the first week in May, I, I, uh, if I remember correctly, we were able to access those middle and high school students uh, course requests that have been loaded in, in Synergy and then start to determine what we could offer. Um, as So I do know that um, uh, uh, kids select a, their first choice and then um, give their, I, I believe it's two alternatives. So it's possible that um, so we may have to go with an alternative, particularly for some electives. But um, I know that uh, Sarah had, and the curriculum um, content offices, particularly our electives offices, have been uh, pretty creative in, in trying to provide those um, students with access to their courses. Do wanna emphasize that our um, high school students who are in IB courses, um, some AP courses, and then our dual enrollment courses will likely be participating in concurrent learning. Um, uh, because each of those courses requires uh, additional certifications of teachers and um, those teachers tend to be kind of one-offs. Um, and so uh, we do anticipate concurrent instruction will happen. We don't anticipate, however, that there would be use of concurrent instruction uh, for the other courses. They're really um, gonna be able to engage in full-on interactions with their teachers um, via the um, virtual environment. And we have a question about where we can find out how many virtual students there are for each school. So I believe, although I'll make myself a note, I think that is posted on the website. Sarah, if you wouldn't mind um, sort of scrolling the website or when um, Rebecca's talking about actual stuff later on, I can certainly look it up. If it's not posted, um, we'll make sure that we were able to put that up. I think that's it for the questions for now. So Rebecca, did you want me to talk or about the reorg? Um, yeah, um, apologies for my dog, right? You know, he's been quiet the whole time until now. Of course. Um, yeah, the, the restructuring. Yeah, yeah, sure, happy to talk about that. So, um, <laughs> Sorry, I lived that dream, Rebecca. Yes, uh, we, we hope you're not under attack. Um, so, um, 
So yeah, as of uh, July 1, uh, what we know as the Department of Teaching and Learning will essentially um, um, split um, uh, uh, into uh, the Office of Academics and that Office of Academics will include um, the uh, CTE, um, uh, um, most of our um, curriculum and instruction offices and the Office of Special Education. Uh, and then we'll have a new office that will live on the second floor and that's the Office of School Support. Um, our student services will be moving to school support as will the Office of Assessment. Um, uh, admin services will belong to school support and then our directors of elementary and secondary education will move there. Um, I say move because we're all living on the first, uh, the second floor and the idea is that both of the offices would be really symbiotic. I, I'm thinking I'm former social studies teacher, so I'm thinking about it as the Office of Academics is sort of the legislatures, you know, we're developing the programs, we're um, uh, working, uh, identifying the resources, and then we're working with the school support uh, to be the executive, they're executing, uh, working with those principals and getting those programs in place. And uh, Rebecca's made mention of this um, a few times in, in the past. This is really gonna help us to systematize and have a level of consistency. Um, our uh, uh, professional learning is gonna be moving to uh, HR and um, uh, they're gonna take on a much wider scope uh, to provide professional learning for the entire, um, uh, well, pro professional learning um, systems for the entire district. Um, our Office of Equity and Equ um, Excellence will move to the um, diversity Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, and uh, as will our, um, our Office of Federal Programs, and that's the management of um, Title I um, uh, grants primarily, uh, will be moving to uh, DEI as well. Um, as far as ACTL is concerned, um, you know, our student services, um, uh, our um, student services advisory committee, uh, we anticipate that you'll continue to be part of um, ACTL um, and uh, the school health advisory board uh, who works closely with Laura Newton, our director of student services and Debbie DeFranco, our um, supervisor of health and PE. Uh, we expect will continue as well. So, uh, and then the Office um, the, the uh, Equity and Excellence Advisory Committee, I think may be in flux, um, uh, but uh, we're certainly working with uh, or expecting that our supervisors of each of those offices would be working um, closely with uh, advisory committees to, so that everybody knows kind of, you know, where do you fall in this reorg as well? Um, Another question is, uh, Bethany says, my general understanding is that elementary school students choosing virtual learning may be disproportionately L students. Do you have a sense of how those students will be supported? Sure, so um, we do have a um, higher than reflected in many of our in-person schools uh, population of L students and then of uh, special education um, students who chose uh, the virtual learning program. Um, as I mentioned from an L perspective, the, um, uh, the uh, L specialist uh, position that was created out of the Title III grant uh, is really going to be working closely um, with our L teachers who um, will be uh, part of the virtual learning program to help um, really serve in the realm of um, a coordinator, like a reading specialist, a math coach, we've got an, a, an L coach, if you will, um, to be able to, to work closely with um, our L students. Okay, um, and someone asked about the org chart, which Reed has posted. I don't know, Reed, whether it responds to um, the request that the title of the job and the current occupant be included in the org chart because when I try and get there from my browser, it's not letting, the link isn't letting me through. Oh, and uh, someone else note, they had the same problem. We can attach, we can get a copy right. and attach it to the slide. And, Super. Uh, uh, and, and go ahead, Brett, but a lot of these positions, you're in the hiring process. So I think this one won't have 
probably names. It'll probably because July one, it, c correct, is kind of the starting date because that it is the starting date. Yep, mm -hmm. we are in process of um, hiring the chief um, operating officer and the chief of school support. Yeah. yeah so uh, the, sorry, this is Reed. Yeah, I don't think there are names that um, attach to those titles and boxes yet, but likely shortly after uh, July 1st, um, we should have all of those people in place and, you know, designated in, you know, the boxes with the titles. And the, um, and, and again, I don't believe having followed it through the, the, the draft of this org chart was presented at a previous ACTL meeting and um, was um, sent out. And I don't believe there were any changes because I can make, I can send that. And that had, again, the multiple, not just around uh, chief, going from Department of Teaching and Learning to, to Chief of Academics, but it will have all of those different um, uh, positions, like in how it rolls up to Dr. Duran. So I'll, I'll attach that. I just want to make sure nothing had um, changed the budget process. And I don't think it did. I don't think it did either. Okay. Um, and then, um, Again, th for those who mi missed my uh, plea to make sure we have uh, contacts um, at your schools so we can contact people over the summer, you know, this is one of those things that we can certainly um, share out through ACTL once it's available, you know, whether it's July or early August, you know, to folks, um, you know, over the summer um, as well, if we have the right, you know, contact information. Um, are there any other questions? I don't know. Oh, Sarah. No, Sarah's just posted a link um, with respect to the budget. Ah, here we go. Um, I've heard about a couple of families that would like to change the model they chose for the fall from distance to in-person. I understand the logic about having a hard deadline for planning purposes, but it seems pretty early now to allow change in case-by-case -case basis. Any thoughts about that? Yeah, I'm really glad, thank you, whoever asked that question. That is um, something I'd like to be able to um, address. Um, so the infrastructure that um, exists, particularly at the secondary level, although I will say that the master schedule in the elementary can be quite a bear uh, to create, uh, but at the, the middle and high school level, our, our directors of counseling um, and counselors begin developing the master schedule for the next year, once they get those course request forms in, and that is typically at the end of February. So it takes a good three months um, from March through June for um, our directors of counseling to develop these master schedules. And they are still balancing classes throughout the summer. And the reason I say that is um, that's really uh, the reason why um, we have set these hard transition times at uh, the elementary, again, that's at each quarter, and then at the um, uh, secondary level, that's at the semester, is because our, we, the, the carefully tuned schedule that allows our kids to access, for the most part, the courses for which they've signed up with and that they need to graduate is not something that can change on a dime. Uh, and so uh, that's why we've been very careful in uh, saying that we can't accommodate changes except through um, uh, the IEP or the 504 process. Uh, if it does become um, evident that a student is not receiving uh, a free and appropriate public education through those processes, then of course we need to, to make adjustments. Uh, but for uh, in general, um, we're not um, uh, accommodating a change requests now because of the infrastructure. And I get it that we asked um, folks to make some decisions before we even knew for sure and for true, you know, uh, that our kids as young as 12 were going to be able to be vaccinated. Um, it's just that, you know, the stars didn't align between um, needing that information and collecting it pretty late. Our, our directors of counseling are still building a master schedule now um, and the, the ability to get our students vaccinated. So um, thanks for asking that question. I think we're caught up, Rebecca. I'm gonna, 
I'm gonna stop sharing. That's fine. And she did mention in the chat that it was for elementary, but the same kind of a goes, it sounds like, as far as the master scheduling. Right, right, for a secondary and that that transition time will be at this semester. Okay. Um, so I don't think what, so um, thank you uh, for all of that. Does anybody have any other, um, I know we tried to cover a lot, but we really wanted to make sure that you had information sort of on the highlights of, um, uh, you know, the kind of those important topics to take back to your, um, your communities. I will share that out and um, make sure everybody um, has a copy and I'll also attach the, the, the new uh, structure as of July 1. Um, so if that, um, well, don't go anywhere, you know, Bridget. <laughs> but um, uh, if you have any other questions as you think about them, you know, put them in the chat. So, so really um, the kind of the last, this last 30 minutes, um, uh, if people had, I think I put this in my email, you know, we would really like to get, cause we're not going to do a survey as much as I kind of noodled over it. I'm like, I'm not going to, let's just be honest. I'm not going <laughs> to, I'm not probably going to get around sending out a survey to get feedback. Um, but you know, we definitely, as we're, um, wrapping up this year, um, you know, and again, be gentle, but we want constructive criticism. <laughs> Or suggestions, um, but you know what? Um, you know, could could we do better, right? What um, information? What topics would ACTL members like to hear? Um, you know, did you did Zoom work okay for you? Um, are you interested in um, doing these meetings in person, virtual next year, a combination? Um, Concurrent, Lord help us, um, if I could figure that out. Um, but any of that type of feedback, um, you know, again, that's how we're going to continue to also make uh, your time commitment here with ACTL and your time commitment back with your communities and your PTAs, you know, more valuable. So, um, you know, you can comment here. You can, you know, let other people, you know, kind of hear your thoughts. You can email me. Uh, you can call me, um, but but really, um, definitely would love to hear any feedback um, from from folks. Um, so I'm going to pause and just see if anybody has anything. Oh my gosh, it was such a wonderful year. Um, let's see, having some meetings virtual, some meetings in person. Um, yeah, I think that. Um, so just so you know, so the school board for next year. Um, uh, we are still working on uh, finalizing the ACTL leadership team for next year, and that will go to the school board on the 24th of June. So as soon as that is all uh, tied up in a nice bow, um, uh, I think a lot of that is going to be decided by, um, by that team, you know, to make sure. But I definitely know from conversations with um, a lot of folks, a lot of feedback, and from the our vice chairs Bethany and Natalie, I don't see Anika or Ryoko or Kelly, but you know, similarly that that is like how do we? We've had great attendance this year, I think, in a lot of our meetings, and um, because I think it's been more accessible through um, you know virtual. So I definitely think there's a lot of interest to balance that, you know. Um, Again, I don't. I can't tell you what it looks like, but I. But I think that. Um, I think it, it helps a lot of people. <laughs> so I don't know, Natalie or Bethany. As do you guys have any uh, comments or feedback on that? You know, I will say that in in one or two of the committee meetings that I attended towards the end of the year, we definitely talked about committee meetings continually continuing virtually because um, those are smaller groups. It's easier to interact and get to know each other a little bit virtually, you know, cause it's only six or eight or, you know, 10 people or whatever. So um, I think there's definitely some committee chairs who are considering that for the smaller group. And then I think, you know, you know, I'm curious to see what people think about the larger group. I'd, yeah. I'd love to see the option there 
for people to meet in person. But I think it's really important from an accessibility perspective to keep the option of people being able to attend remotely. There are folks who've got mobility issues for whom you know, meetings were possible this year that wouldn't have been possible for them otherwise, for example. And someone commented, uh, Merritt, I think, in the chat, you know, that for, for folks with younger kids, uh, the juggling is much easier if you don't have to worry about a half hour or 45 minute transition on each end, you know, to get there, get in the building, get set for the meeting. That's not exactly what Merritt said, but I'm, I'm adding the timing on to, to Merritt's point. So Natalie, um, ASAC is um, probably the largest um, subcommittee and, and certainly has the most uh, people coming from just the community and joining. Um, we're actually talking about doing both, um, having you know the, the members uh, largely <clears throat> gather in person, but have a, uh, a Zoom going at the same time so that other people can tap into that and and join the meeting i'm not sure how that's going to work yet but that's the that's the desire and that's just mo mostly because we have people from the community coming in to any any given meeting that's exactly what i meant nick yeah. it also means that for people who are presenting you know rather for our staff rather than having to stay in the ed center till you know nine o'clock at night or whatever they have the option of actually being at home with their families as well, particularly if they've got like, you know, a 15 minute slot at some point in, in the meeting rather than having to stay through the whole thing. So I really like the hybrid model where people can be in person if they're able to and when they're able to, but where there's the option to, to be remote at the same time. I know it's complicated, but I, I, mean, I mean, I've been in groups that have done it. It can be done. Great. No, I mean, that's wonderful. And, and like I said, I think we've heard that from a, from, a, from a lot of folks and from from different groups. So I definitely think that's something that um, we can partner with, um, you know, DTL or the Office of Academics and figure out how we could do that. Um, having a meeting at SciFax, um, if there's a room that's more conducive, maybe the school board room isn't or whatever, you know, that, that we could have, you know, some sort of concurrent um, you know, option or something. So maybe work with the, the technology folks there. Um, oh, it's a long one. Yeah, but it's, it's a really good point from Maureen with respect to the challenges of communicating back to the, to the school community. Yeah, and that's, um, um, Okay, so do do a like a bullet point kind of summary of the of the meeting. We we had that at one point. We had a, a vice chair who volunteered to do those sort of one two paragraph uh, summary after each meeting that you know made it a little bit more accessible to parents who you know weren't involved in ACTL. Okay, that's that's a um, good. And if you guys, since we don't have many people, you can talk to if you want. I know. Look, we got everybody using the chat. Finally, no, I'm just kidding. But um, we, uh, so because it takes me a while to read. So I'm sorry. Well, I got a verbal. Um, I was trying to type it out, but I'm having a hard time. So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna ask, uh, Miss Loft, the, the chief of school support is gonna oversee principals, and that is a pretty big departure from uh, what we've seen in the last, I don't know, however long it's been under the superintendent. Wondering what authority they're going to have and how is how is consistency going to mix into that? And I wonder if you can just clarify some of that. Yeah, I mean, I can speak to what I know with the caveat that this is a brand new position. Uh, the person hasn't been hired, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so some things may change, but I, I, um, as I understand it, the chief of school support will be um, supervising principals and serving in an evaluative uh, capacity. Um, the expectation is that as principals are developing their progressive plans as they do at the beginning of each year, 
using student performance data and other issues um, to, to inform that, that plan that um, the Office of Academics will be at the table um, to help uh, uh, provide resources, support, to understand what the, uh, the goals are um, moving forward and um, that there will be an expectation of um, some of areas of focus. Um, I've used as an example that equity, for example, has been um, an area of focus uh, in years past, um, having a, uh, uh, an adult that students can make connections with uh, has been an area of focus. Certainly, I would anticipate looking at uh, elementary moving forward to, to next year uh, in our transition to, to structured literacy, that that would be an area of focus. And so I bring that up to say, that um, there would be, that's an example of how we can ensure um, uh, sort of consistency and delivery. I'll use another example too. Um, as of June 30th, uh, APS will be an entirely Canvas district. We weren't um, uh, for, for this past year and we saw the fallout to that. Uh, and so while uh, uh, DTL has worked closely with uh, information services to ensure that everybody's got the training and the resources available, it, it'll be uh, uh, part of the role of school support to help ensure uh, in working with principals that all of their staff are using Canvas moving forward. Um, so that might be a tangible example of uh, what we anticipate will be helpful in providing consistency. Um, Jenny or Kelly, do you guys want to make your points um, directly rather than our reading them? Hi, I'm, I'm Jenny. Sure, I'll try to make my point, um, which one, number one, I thought this is a great opportunity. This was my first year on ACTL and I'm really glad this opportunity uh, exists. I represent Gunston and Something that I found challenging is that um, even though the agenda and a lot of times slide decks were shared in advance, sort of the, the so what or the, the real um, explanation behind the topic didn't happen until the meeting itself. And I found it challenging to come prepared with questions or input from my community because I was learning about it at the meeting. And I'm not quite sure what the um, solution for that is. Maybe um, if like a little bit more of explanation could happen ahead of time, or are there questions that DTL would find it helpful for um, us to take to our communities in advance and then come prepared with that feedback input uh, at the meetings themselves that we could then more of this kind of talking about what the concerns, questions, ideas are from schools um, that, and then I could sort of take those answers back to my community. That's one way I could think of that I might, I feel like I could better serve my school and, and better bring the thoughts of my school community here to this group. Yeah, no, you know, thank you. Um, and that's really good, um, good feedback. Um, uh, so it, it sounds like on both ends, right? So a little bit more on the upfront um, and a little bit more than as a summary and bullet points on the back end from the two, the piggyback comments there. Yeah, thank I just you. Wanted to, sorry, I wanted to jump in because um, I had similar, this is Sheila Leonard from Ashland, similar thoughts as Jenny that in terms of like my role, whether it's reporting information back to Ashlon or to my, you know, whatever your school is, or like advocating for my community, which often then ends up a little bit just being me because as Jenny said, we don't have the information ahead of time. Um, so that was one point. And then two, sometimes I felt that I was waiting for um, feedback either from ACTL or DTL on questions that were a little bit outstanding. And then and then it would be the next meeting kind of by the time we got it. And so it, that like limited my, I was kind of almost waiting for the answers to some of the things we talked about in the meeting and it was harder to report out. I also found that I was on the budget advisory committee before when we were, you know, in person, like pre, pre this life. And um, I found it was easier to have 
fruitful, I, I want to say fruitful, like um, conversations like to the end of a, a point when you're in person, even right now, um, Paula just asked about elementary uh, um, elementary kids, like being able to opt in for in-person. And, you know, I wanted to follow up and be like, wait, so can some elementary kids? But I felt like that was going to be like kind of jabbing because <laughs> you put it in the chat and it's like a little more jabbing. Whereas in person, that's just a point of clarification, mm -hmm. not a big deal. So I think it's kind of easier to have those conversations in person. I totally agree with everyone on accessibility. I have young children. I just put them to bed while listening to this. So like very on board with that. So I just wonder if maybe we could think about topics that might need, to, sorry, I'm talking so much, need like in-person discussions and have those, um, you know, with always in accessibility, like a, a, a virtual option, but kind of encourage people for in-person on those ones and then virtual where it's more, we're just receiving information from DTL and keep those virtual, just kind of thinking about that. Sorry, that was so long. <laughs> No, 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 thank you. You know, appreciate it. Um, and one of the things um, I will say, nor normally for, for those um, that hadn't participated probably on AC ACI or ACTL before, um, we had a lot more meetings. <laughs> um, you know, um, a normal year we would meet, I don't know, you guys tell me, I mean, probably out of the, the eight months, we met twice a month for five or six, maybe more of those months. We had two meetings a month. Um, and the meetings are, were generally, they're all, they were all two hours. Um, and so um, sort of in some discussion, um, again, given, you know, we did shorten the meetings um, to an hour and a half and we've really tried, unless there was something kind of out of whack or a special topic, have tried to keep it to one a month this year. So um, that doesn't, I mean, again, I like the better, you know, clarity up front and, and after. But I think that also has um, contributed to less, um, less time. I mean, it's harder, I think, virtually to your point, um, but that's another kind of thing that um, we're gonna be looking at or the, the leadership team for next year will be looking at is, how, you know, again, what does that calendar look like? Are we gonna go back to have two hour long meetings and, you know, on our some months, you know, are we going to go back to two, two meetings a month? You, you know, so I think some of that, you know, to your point, um, as far as just having more, even just more time on every topic or more time on every, on everything. So again, I don't know if anybody, any, you can think about it and again, get back to us, but, you know, thoughts on, you know, how do you feel about, two meetings, you know, you know, two meetings a month and going back to two hours because they were seven to nine. Um, but like I said, so that kind of that compressed schedule was, uh, was a, a decision uh, to try to account for everybody's um, additional time constraints this year. Um, but again, so I don't know, I know some people who have participated on ACTL for a while um, again, you know, that, that difference in, you know, more time, more meetings, longer, but, but again, with more opportunity to have kind of a, that next level of conversation, I think, to Sheila's, your name is Sheila, it says Sheila. Is your name Sheila? I hope so. Sorry, I'm muted. Am I still muted? Yes, I'm sorry, I'm Sheila. Yeah, okay. I think that gets to names are the same. <laughs> I think that gets to whether we're passing back information. When you just said two meetings, two hours, I was like, oh, well, maybe not then. But uh, <laughs> whether we're passing information back or providing feedback, which I think are just two different things and both like have value. Um, I just want to make sure I'm doing the one, you know, yeah. and that we we're here to do. And, and again, I'll, I'll let other people jump in, but, but, you know, we definitely, I mean, the whole, you know, feedback is definitely, and again, you know, the kind of the feedback loop that, Here's information that what's going on kind of at the county level or, or deep, more detailed information. Um, but the, that feedback loop is sort of um, what we're trying to get to, what we're trying to work toward. And again, this feedback, I think, will really help hopefully improve that, um, you know, what, whatever the schedules look like and whatever the process is. But, but, but that is, so, so again, that's why this, this feedback is, is really, really, uh, at least to me, and again, you know, um, you know, I think it's super, super, you know, helpful. I don't know. Anybody else, again, have any comment on the time value? Bethany has a point on that. And then 
I think Kelly had a more general point yeah. that we could go to after that. Yeah, Sheila reminded me that we used to um, do more with doing breakout groups by levels and areas. So, you know, when we would have a topic and it was relevant for sort of the reps from high schools to sit and talk together and the reps from elementary schools to sit and talk together, although sometimes we had to break the elementary school groups into two groups because it's so many, but um, it allowed us to have more of a conversation and learn from each other and, and, and sort of come to some kind of consensus around maybe a couple of, you know, top items that we all felt like we cared about that we could then report out to the larger group. Um, it doesn't get past your point, Sheila, that it's sort of your perspective, but it did, that dialogue um, what allowed us to sort of explore, you know, check our own assumptions against others, you know, think about our perspective in relation to others, et cetera. So, um, and then it allowed us to sort of distill things down from, um, from the larger conversation. And frankly, it just made the meetings more relevant to, um, you know, the different school level. So, depends of course on the topic a little bit. Yeah, and we did, and I don't know if you guys, um, we. The first couple meetings this year, and, and again, I think it was so new, um, and again, because we shortened the meeting and didn't have as many, but we did use um, the breakout rooms a couple times. Um, not, not a lot, because some of the, the later topics like budget were kind of big, and we didn't do that, but, um, um, but potentially, again, maybe better use of, of the breakout in person, and then somehow ad adapting that to where you know, the virtual people can also, like if we do a group like that, Bethany, you know, somehow bring the virtual people into different, you know, um, different rooms or whatever. Rebecca, it's Judy. Sorry, I don't know how to raise my hand here. <laughs> so oh, that's okay. um, I'm thinking back to uh, years when we have had um, more than one meeting at the beginning of the year just to get people all sort of in the same place mm -hmm. to explain things and understand your role and have a chance to ask questions and all the kinds of things we're talking about here so that we're not getting into the process and then people don't know what they're supposed to do. So maybe that's, maybe, I mean, we met, I think we met with, with staff, we, um, you know, I don't know, central office staff, and got to know who those people were. And then we, um, we just had a chance to have more discussions and ask questions and get into small groups. And then it was okay, the rest of the year we only needed one year. Is Bethany, is that the way you remember it too? Or Natalie? Sorry, I was just trying to type in the chat. Judy, I agree, except that we have to kind of let the back to school stuff unfold. And then we can do a couple, because you can't do it, like, everybody tries to do everything in September, right? right? And everybody's got, they've got back to school night and they've got it at the elementary school and they've That's got right. the middle school and they've got this. So I think the timing has to be calibrated mm -hmm. but that a couple of meetings closer together in the fall, that, there's a big advantage to that. Yep. Right. And getting input from parents on ACTL at different levels to see, all right, did that work? Do you need a little bit more? You know, get feedback maybe each time so we can see where they need, people might need a little bit more information before we move on or something. Thanks. No, appreciate it. Um, and I don't know if anyone would wanna do some sort of you know, podcast of some of the APS 101 stuff that people could listen to on their own time um, and perhaps even before the formal meetings start. Uh, but I, I don't think we've gotten to Kelly's point yet. And I think it's an important one. Kelly, are you out there? I'm here. I've been listening to the meeting on the phone. This has been really helpful. Thank you to everybody and to Rebecca. I just wanted to kind of reiterate, I thought the work session was really eye-opening. And I think the more we can do to keep these important topics in front of the school board during the year are really important. I mean, we have a lot of themes and a lot of initiatives even before COVID. Um, they've had a lot of questions, you know, evidence-based apps and all of these things and personalized learning was, you know, 
rolled out, anything we can do to keep these conversations somehow without being too cumbersome targeted, you know, once a month with school board meetings or something to bubble up concerns to, you know, learn what's not being consistently um, delivered, what's working, what's not working, all of those things I think are really important because I think the work session was really just super eye-opening with the questions that we were getting from school board members, good questions, some questions I think that, um, you know, maybe they should have known the answers to some of those things. And I think that we just need to keep instruction, um, equity, and all of these, you know, the tenants that we have outlined as goals really in front of the school board on the dais and being discussed as much as possible. I know buildings and, you know, energy is very important, but anything we can do to keep going back to that um, and following up at every meeting, you know, why we have disparities, uh, you know, like with certain groups and all of those things, it needs to constantly be front and center on the dais. Um, with leadership asking tough questions and, you know, voting to make changes when possible during the year. So I just wanted to bring that up. I, I really thought I want to rewatch that work session again because everyone did such a great job presenting and putting those things together and anything we can do to, to that's not too much work to keep those things going, I think is important. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thanks, Kelly. Appreciate it. Can, can I piggyback on that one for a sec, Rebecca? Sure. Because I, I, Kelly, I think you're making a really important point there. And part of this comes down to data. And I put a quick note in the chat saying that, you know, you guys ought to meet the committee members, the committee chairs, ACTL reps should be meeting with this data coordinator as early in the year as humanly possible. And, um, you know, I've tried to make the point this year that we need the data, we need it to be transparent. We need the assumption, the default to be that data will be open and they will be public and they will be broken down with full demographics unless someone makes a compelling case for it to be otherwise. And we've had the flip of that situation for so many years on ACTL where we begged for data and we've got little bits and scraps of it and it's it's just gotta change. and. If you couple the demographic issue with the openness issue, then you're getting at the equity concerns. And I think we'll have a much better basis for the kinds of decisions that ACTL should be making. Yeah, um, no, I, again, appreciate it. And, and I am excited again, that I think the best thing for me out of the budget was the data coordinator. <laughs> I mean, I know that's probably, you know, but for ACTL, I do think that's gonna be, well, and. I think the structure hopefully will. Um, and just so you guys know, we, we have asked both through the school board, through Read Our Liaison and um, through Bridget uh, for a permanent liaison from the chief of schools, uh, chief of school support uh, line or, or as well, because um, I think that that would be um, an amazing addition and a, a great improvement for ACTL uh, because a lot of those implementation questions Bridget can't you know answer and that's why sometimes some of those questions it does take time to go back and get answers because it's not her department. So if we have a liaison, a permanent liaison from the the curriculum, you know, who's writing the curriculum, developing curriculum, you know, the on the teaching and learning side, and then who's responsible for that implementation. I think we would have a much fuller uh, view and much ready, uh, better access for a lot of those things. So, so we have requested that. Um, it is supported, but again, we don't have a that position yet. So, um, hopefully, that'll happen as well. Um, so uh, I know, again, we've got about three minutes left. And so I'm going to monopolize that three minutes. And I'm going to say thank you. Um, I thank all of our ACTL members and folks. But I, I definitely want to thank um, the ACTL vice chairs for being amazing and supportive and uh, you know doing so much uh, of the, the work and the advice and helping and supporting all the committees and me and us and everybody else. So Bethany, I know Kelly just dropped off, so she missed my thank you. Uh, Natalie, uh, I don't think Ryoko is on, um, nor Anika. Um, but again, really appreciate all of your time and for, on the ACTL leadership team this year. 
And then lastly, um, I did not forget uh, Miss Bridget Loft and Miss Sarah, wherever she, Putnam, wherever she's still here. But I did want to save uh, you guys for last because it's really been um, a pleasure working with both of you this year and have really appreciated, um, you know, your openness, you know, and really look, listening, I think, to what we're saying. And, and I know that we want to move a mountain in like 24 hours and it's hard to do so, but uh, I, I really do believe that you guys have the same vision um, and that you have been a, a great collaborator and been so helpful. And I know that with the new structure, the data coordinator and all these improvements we've talked about that you know ACTL is gonna be on a great sustainable future. And so I just wanted to say thanks to Bridget and Sarah for being you know really great partners this year in this uh, you know, when you only had a couple other things going on. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, um, really, again, just can't thank everybody enough for your time and effort and any other feedback, please. Everybody has my email and phone number, anything you think about, um, we definitely want to take that and, and again, make ACTL valuable to the people who contribute their time. We want to make it valuable to your, or, you know, your PTAs. Um, because it's only with those voices and that information, you know, that, that then our committees and, and the school board and everybody else can, can start hopefully moving um, in a more positive and um, learning outcome um, direction, data-driven learning outcome direction. How's that? Um, so with that, I will wish everyone an amazing, relaxing, peaceful, healthy summer. <laughs> <laughs> and um, again, really thank everybody so much for your time and your, and your energy and uh, look forward to seeing everybody um, on the flip side, I guess, right? So that's it. Yay, we made it. <laughs> Thanks so much. Stay safe, everyone. Take care. Thank you, Thank you, everybody. Thank you all.